So the past few months have been extraordinary. I suspect that nobody on this committee quite anticipated the intensity of the work. And there's more to come. But I think I speak for all of us in saying that this has been a deeply joyous process. And that we're honored and we're humbled to be serving you in this way. Over and over again, the committee has invoked the First Church Covenant, asking what do those words mean? What kind of minister do we need to help us live it? Can we find a minister who's able to get a more than 90% vote on May 5th? I invite you to imagine the following conversation about what the First Church needs in its next minister. So one of you says, that's easy. The minister's job is to preach. Preaching is the most important thing they do. Hmm, says the English major sitting next to them. That sounds like the job of a preacher. Is a preacher the same thing as a minister? Well, I don't think that's right, says the person in front of you. The minister's job is to care for church members, like a shepherd tending a flock. Pastoral care is their most important task. Well, the other English, the English major says that sounds like a pastor. Is the pastor the same thing as the minister? Way in the back, someone else. In the UU church, a minister must be a social justice leader. They have to be charismatic, charismatic enough to attract followers in the community. That will grow the church. That will grow the UU movement. Whoa! Who said anything about a movement? I just want to be part of a church that welcomes me no matter what I believe. The survey results from Cottage Chats revealed variations on all of these things, and it's with this in mind that the search committee has reviewed prospective candidates. Twelve candidates expressed interest. That's a lot. During January, each committee member spent somewhere around 60 hours in candidate review. Between those hours, we experienced everyday life, new jobs, illness, serious family health crises, deaths of dear friends, human, and hurry. The term walking together has been ever present, like a beacon. We felt the immediateness of walking with one another, and the ever-present covenant to walk with all of you. At this point, we've narrowed our field to two candidates, one man and one woman. They're both short and young, between the ages of 30 and 50, I think. Each has considerable strengths, though they are very different from one another. Each spoke very thoughtfully about how they approach ministry here. They know that we'll expect them to move to Salem or a neighboring community, and they're excited about that. During this process, we've learned some important things. We've learned that UU ministers generally preach between 35 and 40 Sundays a year, and that a worship community often actively partners with the minister to plan each service. Apparently, we here at the First Church have a complicated governance structure. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> We've learned that churches often provide training for their lay leaders. Maybe it's coaching for people who speak from the pulpit, or listening skills for people engaged in pastoral care. Maybe it's facilitation skills for committee chairs. We've learned it's unusual to have a children's moment every Sunday, and that most churches Call it a time for all ages. We've learned that UU ministers expect four weeks of study time each year to deepen their ministry, and that they're expected to report back to their congregations about the learning. We've learned that First Church is not perfect. Perfect. And we've learned that no minister is perfect. We walk together in all of our beauty and imperfection. The committee's next step is to spend a weekend getting to know each of our two candidates. 
I heard it may well be the right person to lead us all into this next year of First Church history. During the week of April 27th to May 5th, we expect to bring one candidate forward. That candidate will preach here on two Sundays and spend the week in between getting to know us. The congregation will then vote on May 5th to call, or not, the new minister. April 27th and May 5th. We hope you're able to be in church on those Sundays. On behalf of the committee, thank you again for letting us walk with you by serving in this way. Misfits 
itself to the world. And it worked out well for him and for the inspiration he caused. Take a look at that film, Eddie the Eagle. And speaking of movies and mischiefs, Meryl Streep got a Best Actress nod for her portrayal of Florence Foster Jenkins in the film of that name. How many of you remember this astonishing mystery? Lady Florence makes her big screen entrance and says why she was so loved. She said, I have absolutely no idea how badly I sing. But I sing. She performed numerous times around the country, and critics were barred from Lady Florence's performances. And any that did sneak through were dismissed as spies, planted by her musical arrivals. She made many, many recordings, but she didn't do any retakes of them. She was incapable of imagining that if she delivered a bad note, it wouldn't possibly be that bad. Yet the records she made became huge hits and have been repeatedly reissued in the years since her death. Though some of them have been reissued with less than flattering titles like Murder on the High Seas. <laughs> Lady Clark always gave her audiences their money's worth, often throwing roses into the audience after the stage performance and then going back into the audience and taking the roses away from people, singing another unasked for encore and throwing the roses out again. <laughs> and Lauren, this is a true story, so. Encores <laughs> make a difference. Lady Barnes had legions of celebrity fans, as well as her adoring public. Her groupies included composers like Cole Porter, opera stars like Lily Khan, and then Rico Russo. Later on, David Bowie and Barbara Streisand counted themselves among her admirers. Her costumes were unbelievable. And her favorite included a giant set of wings and a tent like 18th century ball that she would accessorize with a parasol that she would enthusiastically twirl and feathers that she fanned herself with. Her final concert sold out Carnegie Hall. More than 2,000 music buffs had to be turned away from her unforgettable performance. It was the fastest sellout in the venue's history. By common sense, Lady Florence was the single worst opera singer in the history of theater or opera or music. She possessed not so much a lack of talent, but rather a much rarer thing, a refined anti-talent. <laughs> Would be that refined? What emerged when she warbled was a kind of far kryptonite, a mesmerizing melange of exquisitely flat C's and maliciously sharp F's that were so relentlessly and consistently wrong that their performance left audience somewhere in a state between delirium and shock. No one 
before or since have succeeded in liberating themselves quite so completely from the shackles of musical notation. <laughs> Above all, she was a trier. She was a misfit, but she was a trier. She distilled this idea down to these words. People may say, I cannot sing. But no one can say, I did not sing. She loved enough, she trusted enough to do what needed to be done, to bring herself fully and completely into the world and thereby liberate many others. Cole Porter was her most devoted fan and composed a song for her. Still, he had to stuff a handkerchief in his mouth and viciously stab his foot with an umbrella to keep himself from laughing during her concert. Strangely, they didn't read 
regret the time they spent at work, but they did regret the time they spent worrying. People in their 70s and beyond can teach us how to meet life's major challenges. And in fact, as a result of the study, Dr. Carl talked about a group of people called the elders, who are wise and more happy than much. The elders are people 70 and above. The rest of you are young. <laughs> Better not to be you. People into their 90s say they feel a kind of freedom that they never felt before, and they can live as they want to and have less responsibility and less concern about what other people think. This, of course, is the kind of lesson that any Eagle and Lady Florence as early learners <laughs> trying to teach. Non-elders, we might call youngers, they are torn. They're torn because their souls urge them to slice their lives apart and present only one slice of who they are at a time in each set of circumstances. Fragmented, they live their lives in slices. And at least youngers, confused and really kind of angry about who they are. Elders, you see, we can live our lives unsliced. At our best, we can love and love enough to trust that we are doing what needs to be done. Now, let's be honest, it was never my goal to be an elder. Over the years, I looked at older people and I thought, someday, someday, that might be me. I don't remember those moments as frightening or depressing, but I never really inhabited that future. I don't remember projecting myself into a time when aging would be an important part of my living. Old age is an inevitable destination. And I realize that if I live to deal with then being an elder, though it was never a goal, is inevitable. Truth be told, I never took aging seriously or personally until the last five years or so. I'm all over 70 now, young, in terms of popular culture that is so influenced by my baby boom generation that we are increasingly convincing people to say that 70 is the new 50. <laughs> yes and no. There is most certainly life, love, and productivity at 70 and well beyond. But there are real changes too. Changes that my 18-year-old body, that trim and graceful body, that I have all kinds of fantasies about. Well, there have been changes. I don't like to look in the mirror too much today. It's wonderful to be with the youngers of this congregation, the very young, the rest of you. <laughs> you keep me energized, inspire me, and on my good day, Help me to trust enough to do what needs to be done. But of course, we all know where this journey ends. And we all know that we will be remembrances. <clears throat> I like the way Mary Oliver says it. 
When death comes, let the hungry bear and offer. When death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut. When death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what's it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood, and I look upon time as no more than an idea, and I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a wild of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride, married to amazement. I was the bridegroom, taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made in my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Amen. Um.